Hey guys, this is Daniel from What Obi Plays, and today we're doing a teardown and modding guide for the INEO Pocket Ace. If you haven't watched my first impressions video I released last week, I highly recommend checking that out. I go into detail about my initial thoughts of the Ace, and since filming that video I've been using it more, and I still really like this handheld. I've been having a lot of fun trying out some PS2 games that scale to widescreen and fill up the 3x2 aspect ratio display, such as Ratchet & Clank going Commando. I was thinking about making a video where I show off more PS2 games that scale to fill the display, let me know in the comments if that's something you would be interested in. But for today, I'll show you how to fully disassemble the Ace. Then I'll show you how I modded the controls to make them quieter, even though they were already fairly quiet to begin with. I also wasn't too happy with the thermal stability when I ran some 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme tests, so I redid the thermal pads and paste. Then we'll put it all back together and see if the mods made it better. Before we get started, let's go over the tools we'll need today. We'll need a Phillips double zero as well as a 1.3mm hex screwdriver, tweezers, a spudger, guitar pick, the eye plastics tool, a small thin knife, and a magnetic mat. If you want to follow along, here are the sections I've marked on the mat. You can copy me so you stay organized, since there are a few different screw lengths so not everything is the same. If you've watched my other teardown videos, usually I say the eye plastics is optional and only needed if you want to remove the battery, but unfortunately, if you want to access the D-pad for our mods, you must remove the battery. I'll show it during the teardown, but part of the left speaker is designed in such a way that it will not come out if the battery is still mounted to the frame. But now that we know what we need, let's get started with the teardown. Start by powering off the device, removing the micro SD card, and pulling off the analog stick caps. This is the only step where we need the 1.3mm hex driver, so remove the four back screws on the back shell. I and Neo loves to hide screws under their triggers, grab each trigger and pull it straight off. There is one hidden screw in each trigger well, although it's much easier to take these out than on the pocket Evo. Once all the screws are out, then we can use a guitar pick and run it around the edge of the shell to loosen the clips. There isn't anything attached to the shell, so you can just pull it straight off. The first thing we notice about the shell is these little rubber bits near the top on each side. These are trigger stops and something you don't see on all handhelds, and they dampen the noise when pulling the trigger all the way. The One X Player F1 Pro also uses these trigger bumpers, so I'm glad to see Ioneo using it on the Ace. Set the back shell aside and let's continue on. I do have to give Ioneo credit, they definitely utilize all the space inside a device. This thing is packed to the brim and there's a lot going on here. As with all my teardowns, the first thing I like to do is disconnect the battery, so let's do that. Remove the three screws on the cooling fan, disconnect the connector, and pull it off. Then gently peel back the INEO warranty sticker, or just remove it completely, and then take out the five screws on the heatsink. Use your spudger to pop out the two connectors for this ribbon cable, and then gently pry up the heatsink. The heatsink has thermal paste underneath, so it will be slightly sticky to the motherboard, but it shouldn't require much force to pull off. Once we have access to the motherboard, go ahead and pop off the two top ribbon cables on the right side, that's for the top controls and the battery. You can pop off the others if you want, but we'll do those when we take off the motherboard. Now we need our eye plastics tool, and you want to insert it under the battery but above all the other ribbon cables. Unlike the Evo, there aren't any ribbon cables stuck to the battery, so we can just work our tool back and forth and eventually the battery will come off. We can see underneath there is a huge adhesive pad. I put a big strip of captain tape on almost the entire pad except this little strip. That way the battery can still be stuck to the frame, but it won't be as difficult to remove next time. I said before that it was required to remove the battery to access the D-pad, and the reason is this part of the left speaker housing. Notice how on the right speaker housing this part is straight, but on the left housing it has this little lip. This lip curves under the battery which means it can't be removed if the battery is still attached. I'm not sure why INEO designed it this way, but it makes disassembly and repair much more difficult than it needs to be. Now let's work on the right daughter board, which will give us access to the ABXY buttons. Take out the six screws on the trigger and speaker housing. Pull off the Wi-Fi antenna connectors and then we can lift out the speaker housing. Each speaker housing has the dome switches for the bottom row controls and I'm glad to see the same gold colored domes for these extremely quiet switches. I've never seen a speaker design like this, then again I don't know much about speaker design in general, but this did look interesting to me. It seems like the speakers fire downwards and the housing redirects it to the front. Set that aside and then use your tweezers to pull off the vibration motor connector and then we can pull off the trigger housing as well. Nothing much to say about the trigger housing, but we can see that I was half right about the shoulders and LC and RC buttons when I was doing my impressions video. The shoulders use these big dome switches, but the RC button uses a micro switch. Moving on, flip up the lock on the analog stick ribbon cable and pull it out. 
Then remove the two screws and we can take out the stick module. Pop out this little ribbon cable on the right side of the daughter board and then there's one last screw to remove and we can pull out the board. We can see the same gold dome switch for the start button and the ABXY buttons use a rubber membrane connection. Remove the ABXY buttons, membrane, start button, RC button and we can also remove the INEO and home buttons along the bottom. The buttons are key to make sure they stay aligned when you reinstall them but these buttons don't have a rim. That might give us some trouble when it comes to modding but for now let's move on to the left controls. The left side is mostly the same as the right. Take out the six screws on the trigger and speaker housing and remove them. Don't forget to disconnect the vibration motor cable. Same with the left stick module, remove the ribbon cable and two screws. Pop off the two ribbon cables on the left side and take out the last screw and we can remove the daughter board. Similar to the right side, the D-pad uses a rubber membrane connection. We can pull out the D-pad, select button, and the menu and turbo buttons. The D-pad is mostly the same as the Pocket Evos, just a little less rounded. It also has the four divots that match up with these four prongs on the frame, so the whole rim doesn't hit the frame, reducing the clockiness. The top controls, pop out the ribbon cable for the fingerprint sensor, and then take out the single screw. Then we can use tweezers to pull out the top bar, and then the volume buttons and membrane, and the LC button. I left the fingerprint sensor in place since it has this insulating tape on it. On the top bar, we can see the power and volume buttons use the same micro switch as the LC and RC buttons. For the motherboard, first we need to remove the bottom board. This is where we need that knife. We'll use it to peel back the copper tape. Start from the bottom and gently work your way up trying not to rip it too much. You'll need to at least peel it back up to the heat shield, fully uncovering the bottom board and also this ribbon cable. Once that's peeled back, pop off the two ribbon cables and then remove the three screws and the board will come right out. For the motherboard, pop off the rest of the ribbon cables and then remove the last two screws. Start to pull the board out and make sure to pop off the last ribbon cable hiding underneath the board. There is this bit of gray tape connected to the frame and fingerprint sensor. I just cut that so we can fully remove the motherboard. This is as far as we need to go with the teardown. There's no point peeling out the ribbon cables from the frame. Now let's see if we can make the INEO Pocket Ace a little quieter. If you haven't watched my silent button mods video, I'll leave it linked in the description box below that like button. That video will cover the theory behind these mods, so we're only going to focus on how I applied those mods to the Ace. Now these ABXY buttons don't have rims, and normally that would prevent us from using the TPU rings, but I did notice that there is a small gap between the button and the slot that it goes into. So I tried making a 0.5mm thick ring at 0.2mm height, and it fits perfectly. It sits on top of the keys, and is also thin enough to flex into the slot and not impede the button movement. So that's great, since I prefer the TPU rings to putting strips of electrical tape. For the D-pad, since it's the same general design as the Pocket Evo, I just printed the same ring for that device, and the 0.2mm height seems to work best. The start, select, and bottom buttons don't need modification, since they're those gold dome switches that are silent, but I did apply two layers of electrical tape on the shoulder buttons. I also added a small strip of tape on each side where the shoulder button hits the frame to dampen that as well. Finally, I put one layer of tape on the micro switches for the top controls. My power button was a little too tight for the electrical tape, so I left it as is. We'll do some sound tests after reassembling the device. Now let's talk about thermal performance. The Pocket Ace features the same Snapdragon G3X Gen 2 processor that's in the Pocket Evo, Pocket S, and Pocket DMG, so the performance is already well known. Unmodded and with stock voltage settings, it should hit at a minimum somewhere around that 3800 to 4200 range for the lowest score for the 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme Stress Test. Before I opened up my Evo to replace the thermal pads, it was getting around that mark with about 85% stability. When I ran a few stress tests on the Ace, I found similar performance to the Evo, but with varying stability, typically around 85-90%. to 90%. After modding my Evo, I was getting consistent 4500 scores with over 99% stability, so I wanted to see if we could get those same improvements on the Ace. First, we need to clean off the old thermal paste from the heatsink as well as a copper insulating tape. Then we can use the same knife we used to pry up the copper tape to pry off the heat shield. The chip layout is basically the same as on the Evo, so I just need to cut 1mm thick thermal pads for all these chips. I'm using these XPC thermal pads which are extremely soft, so they'll squish and not put pressure on the motherboard in case 1mm is ever so slightly too thick. Now that I've applied that to these chips and also added a 1.5mm thick pad on this chip to the right of the heat shield, we can close it back up. INEO also applied a bunch of thermal paste on top of the heat shield to make better contact with the heat sink, and I did something similar on the Evo. I used Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut Extreme Thermal Paste and applied it in a similar pattern. 
Then I replaced the heat shield and screwed everything down. It's a good idea to screw it down and then remove the screws and check that the thermal paste has spread out and made full contact. It's better to start with a thin layer and add more as necessary. We'll rerun the stress test after reassembling, so let's do that now. Now let's start putting this back together. Take your motherboard and hold it above the frame. Connect the underside ribbon cable and then start to set it into its place. Make sure the ribbon cables on the right and bottom aren't getting pinched and then fully seat the motherboard. Put in the two screws along the middle of the board and then connect the ribbon cables. Then take your spudger and pat down the copper tape along the top so it doesn't interfere with the airflow. Then insert the bottom board and put in the three screws. Reconnect the two ribbon cables and then restick the copper tape. Put in the LC button and the volume buttons and membrane. Then insert the top bar and make sure it's fully seated. Press down on each button to make sure the membranes and switches are aligned and then put in the single screw. Then reattach the fingerprint sensor ribbon cable. Put the D-pad into its slot and then set the membrane on top, making sure to align the membrane with the posts. Then put the select button and menu and turbo buttons into their slots. Reinstall the left daughter board, put in the single screw, and reconnect the ribbon cables. Reinstall the analog stick and two screws, and then reconnect the ribbon cable. Put in the left shoulder button into its slot, and then the trigger housing. Reconnect the vibration motor, and then the left speaker housing. Then put in the six screws on the housings. Put the ABXY buttons, start button, RC button, the INEO and home buttons, and the membrane back into their slots. The right daughter board is a little more tricky to reinstall than the left. I find it easiest to insert it at an angle so we can make sure it's underneath the little rubber tab on the micro SD card flap and then set it into place. Then put in the screw to secure the board and reconnect the ribbon cables to the motherboard. Reinstall the analog stick and then the shoulder button. Put the trigger housing into place, reconnect the vibration motor, then the speaker housing and secure it with six screws. Finally, reconnect both Wi-Fi antenna cables to the motherboard. Put the battery into its slot and reconnect the battery and top bar ribbon cables to the motherboard. Then put the heatsink back on top of the motherboard, making sure to not pinch the Wi-Fi cables and put in the five screws. Then reconnect the ribbon cable that runs along the heatsink. Reinstall the cooling fan and three screws and then we're almost done. Snap the back shell on, going around the device pressing the clips together. Then put in the single screw in each trigger well and switch to the 1.3mm hex driver. Put in the four hex screws on the back shell. Then press the trigger caps until they snap on and the joystick caps on the front. Reinsert your micro SD card and power it on. We'll go into the gamepad tester app and make sure all the controls work. Looks like everything works, so let's move on to sound and thermal testing. Let's see if our TPU rings and electrical tape mods change the noise profile. To refresh your memory, in my impressions video, I found that the ABXY buttons were about 44 decibels pressing them individually, and about 41 decibels if I focused on one, like playing a button mashing game. The D-pad was a little weird with left and down around 40 dB, but up and right were 42 dB, and the shoulders were 43 dB. As you can see here, the ABXY buttons dropped down to 40 dB and 39 dB when mashing a single button, which is a 24% reduction according to the Sones principle. If you don't know what Sones are, I'll leave my button mods video linked below, but essentially they're a unit of measurement that allows us to more easily calculate the sound difference the human ears perceive, since decibels operate on a logarithmic scale. The D-pad is now a consistent 40 decibels no matter which direction I press, which represents a 13% decrease and the shoulders are now 39 dB, which represents a 24% decrease. So overall, I would consider this mod a success. It's great we can lower the button noise this much, every little bit helps. While I was happy with the control mods, the same cannot be said about the thermal mods. I mentioned earlier that the Pocket Evo's thermal performance went from about 3850 lowest score to 4500, going from 85% stability to over 99%. I was hoping for similar results with the Pocket Ace, but sadly that was not the case. Even though they both use the same chip and have the same memory and storage specs, after replacing the thermal pads and paste, the Ace is still not able to achieve the same consistent performance as the Evo. We're getting an average around 3600 or so for the lowest score, with about 86% stability. To put it in perspective, before the mod it was getting an average of around 3700 lowest score and 87% stability, so we actually lost some performance by replacing the pads, which is unexpected and definitely not what we want. I use the exact same thermal pads and thermal paste as on my Pocket Evo, so I think the stability difference is due to the size of the heatsink and cooling fan. If we take a look at both the Ace and Evo's cooling systems, we can see the Evo's cooling fan dwarfs the Ace's fan, and the heatsink is much larger as well. 
I don't have an Odin 2 portal, but some helpful community members ran the wildlife extreme stress test for me and got 3869 for the lowest score with 98% stability. So I think it's just a physical limitation of the smaller cooling system and not something we can get around with thermal pads. All is not lost though, because there is one more thing we can try. If your device is rooted, which I always root my devices so I can have full sync thing access, you can undervolt the G3X Gen 2, which will give us that performance back and more. I won't go over the process to root, but I will link below an excellent guide that the community has written, which gives you step-by-step -step instructions for what I'm about to show you and more. It was originally written for the Pocket Evo, but everything will basically apply to the Pocket Ace as well. I had the undervolting profiles already copied to my device, and I'll scroll down and install the KonaBest app. Once that's installed, I'll launch it, and it will analyze my device and ask me which chipset I'm using, and I'll select the G3X Gen 2. First thing we want to do is to go to Import Export, and we're going to tap Export to File. We'll name it Stock Preset, which will back up our current stock voltage settings in case you want to revert the undervolt later. Then we'll tap Import from File and navigate to our folder with the various profiles. Normally you should start with a 5 millivolt profile and work your way up, but I'm going to jump to the Cocta Final Profile since I know that one works best for my device. This will vary based on whether you won the chip lottery, so I would start from the beginning. Once we have that selected, we're going to hit Repack and Flash New Image. This will write the settings to the system and then prompt you to reboot. Once you've rebooted, now we can launch 3D Mark and run the Wildlife Extreme Stress Test again. You'll want to do this every time you select a new profile, since this will be how you verify stability and that it doesn't crash. One more thing before you actually run the test is to open IO Window and on the Performance tab, click the little Edit button next to Performance Mode. Make sure Max is selected and then on the GPU limit, change that from 1000 to 860. This will help the GPU stability as well. Now our results are much better. We're getting in the 4500s for best loop score and 4100s for lowest scores with around 90% stability. It's still not the 99% high bar I personally have for stability, but it's more consistent and both the best and lowest scores are much higher. I didn't do any undervolting testing before I redid the thermals because I forgot, but I think undervolting would probably yield similar results with the stock thermal pads. It seems like the stability comes down to the smaller cooling design compared to a much bigger device like the Evo. Let's start wrapping up with my thoughts. Overall, I think this device is moderately difficult to fully disassemble, given we must remove the battery in order to access the left controls. I really wish Ioneo did not put that lip on the left speaker housing, it really doesn't make any sense to me. Other than that, there are a lot of screws, but nothing too complicated. I would recommend opening it up to add the TPU rings, that really helped with the noise, but I would not recommend redoing the thermal pads. It really was not worth the time and cost, and I think you can get the same performance gains by just rooting and undervolting. I hope you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing. I have many more videos planned, and my Pocket S2 Pro should be shipping any time now. I'm still working on my final review for the Ace, if you have anything you want me to cover in that video that wasn't in my impressions video, let me know in the comments. Thanks and have a great day.